<laughs> well, we did catch a fish. <laughs> and he's off. <laughs> what is that? It was a very small, very small coho salmon. <laughs> You know, you fly across the country and uh, you, you look out the window, you can't help but see what the impact of humans is on the landscape. And we have done things to the atmosphere and to the earth that are accelerating the natural rate of change. From a scientific perspective, there is no doubt that climate change is happening. The lure is called a coho killer. How's that for blood and guts? There are records of tribal settlements that are, you know, eight to 10,000 years old around here. These tribes, by and large, subsisted on all the various different flavors of salmon. Yeah, we're gonna come out here and we're gonna tool around for a couple hours and hopefully we'll catch a couple fish, maybe three, four, if, if we have a good evening. But, you know, it used to be that you could come out here and inside of an hour, everyone on the boat would just be swimming with fish. And that's this idea of shifting baselines, the world the way it once was. I never get tired of seeing this stuff, really. If people had their act together, they would make this into a national park. The tide is the rising and falling of the sea, which happens due to the gravitational pull of both the moon and the sun. So when this tide is higher, you'd never even know that these lower rocks are out here. It's a large area that can be exposed. And so for organisms that make their living here, you know, this is a, a pretty harsh thing because they're inundated by water and then they're exposed to air. That's a huge temperature shift. What we're doing here today is we're monitoring the community of organisms that live in the rocky intertidal zone. And we're keeping track of how that community changes. With climate change, when you have these, these periods where the temperature rises, um, it is going to change the fundamental nature of this ecosystem. This is one of our long-term monitoring plots where we're focusing on rocky intertidal communities. As part of this long-term monitoring program, we have set up a series of permanent plots that we come back to monitor every year. This is a plot which is 10 meters long, and it really spans two zones, it's the barnacle algal zone up the, on top, and then down below in the middle elevations, the mussel beds. Intertidal zonation is a pattern of community structure that results from physical tolerances and biological interactions that results in distinct bands of organisms at different elevations. The idea here is, is that we're not just trying to assess 
the density of organisms and the type of organisms within each one of our plots, but we're also trying to assess how the barnacle zone and the muscle zone are contracting and expanding over time. Well, with climate change, we're expecting that we're going to get heightened air temperatures. So it's going to be hotter and drier up here. And they're already at the fringe of their ability to exist here. These mussel beds create habitat for a whole host, a whole community of other organisms also. I would like to think that, uh, that when my children uh, get to an age where they can truly understand exactly what their dad does for a living. I hope they actually think that I am doing something worthwhile, that I've done something worthwhile, and that I have contributed. Yourself. I've got such a great crew, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in relationships. So the emphasis is on doing the best work that we can do, having it be worthwhile work, and enjoy doing it. The thing about climate change is that there's no one particular item which is a smoking gun. So you can't look at any one particular instance, uh, one particular heat wave event, one particular storm and say, aha, this is proof of climate change. Proof of climate change is taken over a longer period of time. This long-term monitoring is very important because we want to be able to show these long-term trends because we're expecting to see a steady decrease in ocean pH, incremental increases, say, in the frequency and magnitude of storm events, increases in sea temperature and sea level, things like that. Proof of climate change is actually the weight of evidence over a period of time. That over there is to me just really beautiful. This is the Olympic coast. This is archetypal classic Olympic coast right here. Ocean acidification has a major impact on marine ecosystems. Human beings have been combusting fossil fuels for a very long time. Since prehistoric times, we've essentially doubled the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere needs to come into equilibrium with the amount of carbon dioxide dissolved into seawater. As that CO2 dissolves into seawater, through the magic of chemistry, it forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid effectively decreases the pH of ocean water, making it more acidic. Acidic water is very bad for marine organisms. Most marine organisms use calcium carbonate to form shell structures. Low pH water can dissolve those shells. And all marine organisms use biochemical pathways to conduct their daily lives. Those metabolic interactions are mediated by the pH of the environment that they're bathed in and affect growth and reproduction and ultimately life and death. And so what we have done is we've taken a big tide pool like this, and we have mounted an instrument on the side of the tide pool. We're trying to measure what the pH is of this water that's bathing all these organisms. Every half hour, it takes a measurement. Now, of course, it's in a tide pool, so there's a certain point at which the tide comes in, and this is all inundated. If we can see changes in community that also correlate with changes in the ocean chemistry, that's a very powerful tool to say what the impacts of a change in climate are.
This area 200 years ago, I dare say, would have looked almost exactly like this. Very similar to this. The National Park Service manages lands that by and large are some of the most pristine lands that you can find in North America. They're the most untrammeled, untainted areas that you can find. We monitor long-term climate change in the national parks so that we can assess how climate change is impacting these valuable park resources. There's also great value to this monitoring for comparative purposes to more impacted areas outside of our boundaries. Man's role in climate change is that primarily through the combustion of fossil fuels, we've accelerated the process. And as a society, we're vitally linked to the ocean. We rely upon the ocean as a source of food and in a variety of different ways. As climate change begins to impact marine food chains, that has the potential to profoundly impact how we interact with the ocean, how we rely on the ocean and the terrestrial environment. We have been put along a certain path, a certain trajectory with climate change. But that doesn't mean that we should throw up our hands and say that all is lost, sit back and enjoy the ride and keep doing what we're doing. I think that, uh, that we can ameliorate some of the long-term effects by moderating some of our behaviors. As a species, and as a society, we have the obligation to think that far ahead. At the end of the day, I want to enjoy life. I enjoy good food, I enjoy good drink, I enjoy good places and good people. And if I can do some good while I'm here, that is icing on the cake. <laughs> so I'm sure you will be far from the village.